Hey everyone, thanks to one of five. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Thank you for joining Coaching PJ Triple M, um, but they'll join the bill. Um, and then we will have the recording for this as well. I just want to quickly introduce myself. Thank you for joining. My name is Antman Pimentel Mendoza. I am one of the acting co-directors of the Multicultural Community Center um, at UC Berkeley. Thank you so much for joining us for the SSSJ event series, uh, Aspirations for Material Anti-Racism, What's Next? Today's session is called Collectivity, Community, and Mutual Aid. Uh, before I begin, just want to point out that uh, auto-generated captions are available. Uh, you can activate those at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, we are going to have folks uh, unmute capability to be disabled just so that we can uh, get through the event, but please feel free to drop questions you have um, in the chat as things go on. Um, and then, yeah, hello, welcome. <laughs> My name again is Antman Pimentel Mendoza. I'm going to give a quick land acknowledgement, read some background or share some background with you all about this event series, then introduce our panelists. Uh, but to begin, um, this statement was developed in partnership between Native American Student Development and the Moek Maloney Tribe and is a living document. We recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Moek Maloney Tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also that we recognize that the Moek Maloney people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. We also want to name that a land acknowledgement is only beginning. So with that, we'd also like to invite folks to continue learning more, including by going to the link I'm gonna drop in the chat uh, for aloneyland.berkeley.edu, where Native American Student Development has compiled many resources for you to peruse and to continue to learn more. And so quickly, some background behind this event series. I hope you join us for our previous events, and if not, um, welcome. Uh, this event is part of the Staff of Students of Social Justice Program, uh, which uh, was originated to imagine the opportunity for collective learning um, on emergent topics around um, social justice for staff people, recognizing the roles of staff people on this campus as workers and also learners in this community of learning. Um, it originally started in 2020 when virtual course delivery allowed for staff people to audit uh, Zoom classes. And since the course delivery model has shifted back to in-person largely, um, and as we continue to think about the evolution of this collaboration between the American Culture Center, undergraduate education, and the Multicultural Community Center, we are curious about what ways we could create even greater opportunities for staff and the Berkeley community to engage in these conversations. And hence, this event series was born, Aspirations of Material Anti-Racism, What's Next? And today's topic, like I mentioned earlier, collectivity, community, and mutual aid has been an emergent issue since the program began in 2020. These topics have been a thread that students, that staff students, that worker students have been talking about in this course and in these courses um, facilitated by our uh, graduate student, David Maldonado. Um, and we're really excited to invite uh, Dean Spade and um, Eric Stanley to have this conversation with you all today. I'm gonna to read brief bios, give them a chance to introduce themselves as well, and then I have some formal questions prepared for them before we go into Q&A. So Dean Spade has been working to build queer and trans liberation based in racial and economic justice for the past two decades. He's the author of Normal Life, Administrative Violence, Critical Trans Politics, and the Limits of Law, the director of the documentary Pink Washing Exposed, Seattle Fights Back. His latest book, Mutual Aid, Building Solidarity During the Crisis and the Next, was published by Verso Books in October 2020 and has been since published in Spanish, Catalan, Czech, Korean, Italian, and Portuguese. And Eric A. Stanley is the Haas Distinguished Chair in LGBT Equity and an Associate Professor in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, where they are also affiliated with the program in Critical Theory. Their most recent book, Atmospheres of Violence, Structuring Antagonism and the Trans, Queer, Ungovernable, was recently published by Duke. I'm really, really thrilled to be part of this conversation, and I'm thrilled that you all are here as well. I'm going to hand it over to our to our panelists uh, to share any introductory remarks they'd like about where and how they're entering today's conversation or anything else they want to share. 
Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, inviting us to this conversation and thanks for coordinating us, Antman. Um, I'm Dean. I'm joining you all from Seattle, Duwamish land, and I'm um, just excited to see what this space is like and uh, connect with all of you. Hi, everybody. I'm Eric Stanley. I know some of you all because I work there. Um, I'm really excited to be in the spaces with you all as well. Um, one caveat is I'm in a hotel room right now in um, Providence, Rhode Island, which um, I described as a haunted TJ Maxx. That's what it looks like. And so my internet's not that great. So if I freeze or something like that happens, I apologize in advance. I've tried to find better internet, but here we are. That said, in the spirit of mutual aid, we're going to keep it going. Thank you so much, Eric and Dean. And I'm gonna just note really quickly, um, again, the chat is enabled. If you have questions that come up, um, please go ahead and drop them in there. I'll take note of them and we'll get to them um, at, during the Q&A portion. But I do have three pre-prepared questions I've shared with our panelists. Um, and so to kick us off, uh, my first question is, what does history have to teach us about the current landscape of mutual aid? Who's going first, Eric? You can go first and then I'll go after. We'll just keep doing like that. So we're not like, yeah. <laughs> okay, you'll go, you'll go first next time. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this is a, a big and cool question. Um, I guess for me, um, you know, like we are living in these horrible crises um, and there's nothing new about crisis. There's nothing new about like world ending level crises. They're always going on. And there's some specific things happening in the current crises, some of which are like ones that are, you know, um, not before seen, like the level of ecological crisis we're in is, is, is not before seen on earth by humans. Um, and, and then a lot of kinds of crisis that are ongoing things we've been dealing with for a long time, like um, you know, but that are also kind of like an untold level of extreme, like having the largest prison systems and the most militarized border systems ever on earth among humans and things like that. Um, and, it, you know, the I think the most extreme wealth inequality ever on the globe is happening now. Um, so it's some pretty wild conditions. Um, and in crisis, you know, people have to survive and help each other live. And part of all resistance movements in all of history is that you're both attacking the systems that you disagree with and that you think are hurting you and you're helping each other survive right now the conditions that those systems produce and so i think for me studying social movement resistance and studying um the tactics of um mutual aid that people have always used and seeing like how they do it and um you know, what's hard about it and what it generates relationally for people and how it makes other other parts of the other tactics possible, right? Like, you know, just really basic stuff. Like if we do, if we have street medics, it makes more kinds of protests happen when the cops have weapons like tear gas. Or if we have, um, I was just reading, you know, I really love this book, In Defense of Looting by Vicki Osterweil. It's such a good book. Uh, maybe maybe someone wants to write it in the chat um, or give a link to it. That'd be cool. Um, and there's a really cool part in that book where she talks about in the 1930s um, during the Great Depression, there were these people who who did this. Uh, they were called black bugs and they were it was a group of people and often include a lot of black people um, going around and stopping evictions by just filling the, like the apartment that people that would be um, being evicted. And they stopped 77,000 evictions in New York City in the early 1930s. That's like, just think about like the scale of like what mutual aid can look like, these kinds of like, like what it means for us to, you know, when I think about what mutual aid is, I think of it often as the part of movement work where we're like directly supporting people with like Im immediate survival needs. So eviction is an example of that, like trying to stop someone's eviction or trying to give someone food support or trying to, you know, like those kinds of things that are about like people's individual issues, but they're happening to a lot of people at once. And it's mutual aid when we're um, like, doing the support work based in a shared understanding that the systems are the problem, not the people, you know, because like charity and social services is always like, what's wrong with you? Because you are in this crisis. Um, mutual aid says, oh, what's wrong with the systems that are producing this crisis? How can we support you and be building a collective action-based response to this? And so that those those black bug squadrons are such an like beautiful example that I hadn't heard before reading her book of 
people using collective action to like meet an immediate need and stop something that's happening that really hurts people. Um, but there's a zillion examples of that. But I, so I think to me, like, um, we're living in these like mounting crises. We're seeing it in our communities, like so many people we love living outside, living in cages, um, you know, not having the basic things we need, like living under a healthcare for profit system that's so dangerous, all these things. And um, mutual aid, part of the reason I've worked a lot on mutual aid in the last few years, kind of like trying to talk about it explicitly. I mean, it's always been part of all my movement work because it's just part of movements. But part of the reason I've been trying to be really explicit about it in recent years and just kind of name it more is that um, the accounts of social movement history we often get are like, we like really cut it out. They're all about like, oh, these courts did these things and these, you know, important men made speeches and these, you um, um, you know, laws change and like they never talk about like how what most ordinary people were doing and can do. And it makes it seem like um, resistance work is something like a specialty for people who are like elite and like either get elected or become judges or work in a nonprofit. When in reality, social movements are made of like just zillions of ordinary people like having to do um on the ground, direct work together, both like direct action against the systems that we're attacking and like direct mutual support work. So um to me, um, like lifting up and naming what mutual aid is, saying how it's different than charity, seeing how people have tried it, seeing what's worked and letting ourselves imagine um, what it would be like if more and more people were mobilized given the threats we're facing. And, you know, in the, in the last three years, we saw a really, um, in, like a lot of people started doing mutual aid work who hadn't previously been involved in movement work. Either they started doing COVID mutual aid work or mutual aid work related to the uprising in 2020, like people joining bail funds and people like, doing direct support to people in the street facing tear gas and just like all this range of things. Um, and that's really exciting. And we need like so many more people to be, be and stay mobilized for what we're facing. And so um, I think it's helpful to like, look at like where even large numbers of people have done that and to study where it's working now, like where even really small things are happening in our immediate communities that are um, that are working in some way, which doesn't mean working perfectly. Cause like that is not a thing, but instead like, Oh, people managed to, get like people managed to like do water delivery during the summer at this encampment, like pretty consistently. And it really helped people there not lack water or people managed to do like consistent letter writing to people inside prisons and jails nearby them or like any, anything where people are able to kind of coordinate together on purpose and know what they think the problem is and have that be tied to other social movement strategies um, that are about attacking those systems, like not having the mutual aid operate like totally independently from the, from other parts of the movement, but instead really be like um, integrated and back and forth, even if people are like specializing and like really focusing on what's happening at housing court in my city or whatever. Um, so that's kind of how I think about like its role in our current landscape. Thank you so much, Dean. Um, and if you have not read Dean's most recent book, Mutual Aid, please check it out. I know it is in the Berkeley Library because I teach it all the time. Um, it's an incredibly valuable resource and helps us think a lot about, um, you know, both all the things Dean just said, right, are kind of contemporary moment and what's similar and what's different, um, but also a historical understanding of, um, you know, mutual aid, even when it doesn't go under that, uh, doesn't go by that name, right? And that's an important part as well, because we've all always been engaged in different forms of mutual aid and how can we kind of lift that up and amplify that? And I think that that's one of the questions that history helps me ask, right? Um, because we have these examples that oftentimes we might not know about, right? And the hiddenness is part of the story, right? And so if we look at like the struggle to save the I Hotel, like I'm going to use local examples, right? The struggle to save the I Hotel, right? That's a massive, um, uh, that was like a massive formation of multiple mutual aid networks that came together to attempt to stop that eviction, right? Or the Panthers Free Breakfast Program also in Oakland, I mean, Oakland, I hotel San Francisco, um, in the ways in which, uh, you know, people's direct needs were not getting met. And so people came together, pulled resources and said, you know, young people are not going to go to school hungry. So we're going to feed them, right? And if we pull together all these resources, instead of trying to do it incredibly atom in, in, like in an uh, atomic way, then we can come together and create a much larger impact or the whole history of food not bombs, which is also like a very kind of Bay Area, has a Bay Area history. Um, you know, taking um, a little bit from everybody, you know, if, if, if everybody pitches in a little bit and then you can amplify and expand 
um, the, the possibility. Well, do, in, in something that Dean helps me always remember that, of course, one of the um, essential parts of mutual aid is that these are all um, done through a politicizing lens, right? So it's not just, you know, here's some food. It's like always asking the question, why do we not already have food when there's too much food in the world, right? The crisis of capitalism is overproduction. You know, why are people throwing away, you know, hundreds of trillions of tons of food every day? You know, why, when you work at a restaurant, do you have to like pour coffee in front of, on top of the extra food instead of setting it out back? Right, it's asking all those questions, which then politicizes the survivability rather than just reproducing a kind of charity model. And that's something that I think Dean's work is really helping us understand because that's essential. Thank you both so much, and really appreciating the Eric your rootedness in these local examples are really helpful. I think for us thinking about uh, the place that we're in and thinking about like the opportunity. Uh, and uh, Dean, your comment about uh, systems are the problem not the people, I think lends itself to this next question I have for you all, which is how does transness and queerness inform your understanding of structures of harm and violence and, and also your visions for collective liberation? And then I don't know if we wanted to take turns per suggestion and have Eric Mann first. <laughs> sure, I'll go first. Um, so I think that, um, a couple of things. So I think uh, trans and queerness as politics as ways of being in the world as identities, right? There's a kind of knot there that we both need to disarticulate and also hold together, right? So a kind of trans and queer analysis is necessary, not only if we're thinking about quote unquote trans and queer people. So I think that that's really important because oftentimes it's like, oh, that's just for those people or like that's only useful for thinking about that, right? But I think what it does for me is remind me that, you know, a kind of structural analysis of heteronormativity and gender normativity are, are vital for the way that we think about everything. So that's, that's one part of it. Um, but, you know, in particular, right, as historically and perhaps contemporarily outlawed people, um, trans and queer people, particularly, uh, you know, uh, low income and or trans or queer people of color have always built really elaborate networks of care and mutual aid um, by necessity, right? Um, so one of the things that I think a lot about and I write about sometimes is, for example, Star House. Um, STAR, which stands for Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, that Marta P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, a um, uh, kind of formation that they built in 1970, right, the kind of first incarnation of that was, you know, more or less, uh, you know, collective living situation, right, because they understood that one of the primary things that their community needed as self-described Black and Brown street, street queens was a place to sleep, right? And so we have that legacy, right? And that's a, 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 a specifically and namely trans politic that um, foregrounds the ways in which people need their, you know, their daily needs met. Otherwise you can't go on to organize and you can't really think about, um, you know, larger kind of uh, more systemic ways of understanding the political if you have nowhere to sleep, right? And what's so important about that as an example is because we need a whole lot more of that right now, right? Trans and queer people are so hyper represented in houselessness, especially in the Bay Area, right? Especially in San Francisco, which likes to assume that it will be the opposite, right? Um, and so when we're thinking about what's going to constitute a trans and queer politic, right? It's access to food, it's housing, it's abolition, it's the destruction of borders, right? All those things, um, you know, I think are, are, you know, among the most important. And so for me, a kind of trans and queer analysis reorients that, you know, that, 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 that political understanding towards thinking about those histories. I love hearing you talk about these things, Eric. Um, yeah, a few things come to mind. I mean, it will also like, I think, you know, obviously one of the things we're always doing as feminists and queer trans um, thinkers and people who care about queer and trans people's lives and survival is like pushing back against the existence of a politics that's like that's not important you know like there's like there's there are versions of like an anti-racist politics that are like let's not talk about women or queer and trans people or versions of an anti-war politics or whatever so one thing we're doing is we're always having a big argument with other um 
people on the left or whatever to be like, oh, hey, this actually is central. There's no way of thinking about capitalism or prisons or whatever without understanding that um, capitalism and white supremacy and patriarchy are co-constitutive. They're braided together. They all need each other. They all made each other happen. And so we can't like, let's talk about the women later. Let's talk about, you know, that kind of nonsense that we've all seen in movements. And so that's one move our work is always making. Like, I think Eric and I have spent a lot of the last couple of decades, like making certain interventions in like the, in like the realm of people doing prison and police work that, that center where like, Hey, look at what's happening to queer trans people in prison with prisons and things like that, you know, so that, and, and, um, and having those like really important conversations about just the complexities of like, who's vulnerable and how, and why does the, why do these systems organize themselves around gender and why are they obsessed with enforcing gender norms? It's not a coincidence. It's not accidental. It's central to how they operate. Um, why is sexual violence like inherent to the border, to the prison, to the war? Um, to, you know, what poverty is. So I think that's part of it. Obviously for me, my own experience as a queer trans person is one of my windows into politicization, you know, and like as a person, you know, impacted by patriarchy from birth in the particular ways that I have been and my own experiences of like anti-queer and anti-trans violence and discrimination and stuff, you know, like it's like we all... um and my own experiences of loving other queer and trans people and experience and, and, and losing them or having them experience fans. Like, you know, we all have like our own skin in the game. That is the basis often of our politicization from which we build further solidarities beyond our own experiences. Um, so I think that is like, I have to say that I think also, and I think so much of my work and Eric's work and our collaborations are also about this. Like we, can see how in our lifetimes, some kind of LGBT politics has been such an intense site of co-optation. And we have a lot of responsibility to respond to that. Like there's this way in which, um, you know, the, the move, the big, the big neoliberal move is to take a group that's despised or hated or stigmatized and then make a, like a, a performance of including that group and therefore legitimizing the violent institutions by saying it protects those groups. So that, you know, being like the cops, I mean, I just, for the first time, two days ago, walked by my first Seattle police car that's got the rainbow all over it. I mean, you know, like, like that move, the move of saying, oh, the police and prisons protect, exist to protect women, exist to protect queers, or um, the military has queer and trans people in it, or what, like those moves, um, or, you know, I mean, where is better example of this in the Bay Area where you have like these politicians who are like simultaneously like completely endorsing gentrification and police expansion and um, and and everything that displaces people saying they're pro queer and trans or being gay politicians or whatever, you know, like that, those that being able to trace the misuse of our struggles. And also being able to really clearly name why the interventions that they say they're making on our behalf actually do not help us and are um, part of a package that really hurts our communities is essential because they do so much stuff in our names now. You know what I mean? Like so, so much. Like we are like a favorite darling of that neoliberal strategy. We're not the only ones, but we really have a special fucked up, terrifying role in it. Um, you know, not actually us, but the idea of us. Um, so that feels really important. I think related to that, people have been you know, talking a lot lately about the level of like anti-trans legislation happening all over the country and the kind of special role we're playing for the right right now. Um, and I, I, I think one of the things I just want to say about this that ties back to the first question about mutual aid is like, I feel really freaked out about how there's this move that happens where it's like, oh my God, the right is after us, especially in these red states. And and like, it's a, like, there's a kind of liberal politics where we're supposed to like stay home and wring our hands and be like, oh no, it's so terrible. Oh my God, it's, you know, what's happening to queer and trans people in Kentucky. And there's this kind of set of things happening. There is imagining those pieces of legislation, especially the ones that are about children. People imagine them about white children who are like middle or upper, upper class and have supportive parents. That That's the imagined child. That is not the average trans person on any level, but that's the imagined trans child. And then it becomes the Republicans want to hurt her and I want to save her or something, right? But also there's nothing I can do about it because it's happening in Kentucky or whatever. And so there's, there's like 7,000 things we have to do to get out of that <laughs> idea that that is the problem, you know, and, and really think about like, okay, first of all, how can we have a complex account of fascism and why it's interested in gender and sexual enforcement 
norm enforcement and always has been in all of its iterations. So how can we be like, whoa, what is fascism doing on a bunch of fronts, including where I live? Because it's everywhere. It's in the police department in where I live. It's in the ICE. It's in, you know, like it's happening where I live. It's not far away. Two, who are the most vulnerable queer and trans people likely when this politics changes? Because this the politics isn't actually about laws, right? Like the fantasy is like these bad laws are going to pass and instead we should have good anti-discrimination laws. Actually, it doesn't really matter what laws are on the books where you live in a lot of ways. Like vulnerability is so much more than laws. Like police don't actually enforce laws. They just like attack people who they think look suspicious, right? Like, and so you could live in a jurisdiction where there's great laws on the books for queer and trans people, like probably where you all live and actually queer and trans people are experiencing horrible violence in shelters and tons of houselessness and stuff, right? Where you could live in a jurisdiction where the laws are really bad and that's also happening, right? So we could ask ourselves, how does the kind of culture war narrative make people more vulnerable? Because I think that does happen. And then who does that make more vulnerable? It doesn't really make me a lot more vulnerable because I don't have a ton of contact with state violence institutions because I'm white, housed, and employed in, in a set of ways that make me less vulnerable. But if I was, um, uh, you know, like easily identifiable as disabled, as a person of color, as a queer and trans, and in foster care and dealing with like group home people, social workers, the folks at the welfare office, the the you know the guards at the jail or the youth jail, you know, like all of that stuff those people are stirred up by this increasing cultural homophobia and transphobia, and they have a lot of access to hurt me. And so I think one of the things we can do is when we see these moments, we could be like, yes, yeah, something bad is happening with anti-trans legislation, but it's not really only about the laws. I mean, yeah, the laws are bad. A lot of them will be knocked down by courts. Some of them will be enforced. Some of them won't, but also a bunch of stuff will be enforced whether or not it's legal. And all of that will happen in a lot of places. So we can definitely do solidarity folks in Kentucky if we can find ways. Like I know some people are trying to help folks move out of some of those states and stuff. Absolutely, let's help get, get people where they wanna be and everything as always. But also like there are thousands of unhoused queer and trans people, including youth, but also adults who we also care about wherever we all live. And so the, like the example that Eric gave of, of STAR, like we need a lot more people in our communities doing like, community housing programs where we're just like, I've got a basement, I've got a couch, I've got a hide a bed. Like people are coming out of foster care, people are coming out of prison. Like there is not, there's like so few beds in the social services realm for like people facing you know intimate partner violence, all the people who need a place to sleep for all the systemic reasons that affect our communities. We could be doing projects like that, which are not easy, <laughs> you know, like that's like we, you know, you could be, you could be writing letters with queer and trans people in the cages in our own county. We could be, there's just so much we can do right now. That's not just like watching the sideshow of whatever's happening in Tennessee or, you know what I mean? Like that's the mutual aid move is to ask like, oh, how is this landing on people's lives right here where I live? How can I like care about and be mobilized about that right here? Um, and that I think is really important because queer and trans life has this like really spectacular thing happening nationally where it's like the Democrats are like, we love them. Let's bomb somebody, you know, and the Republicans are like, we hate them. Let's bomb somebody. And like, we need to be like, what do, what's our account of what's happening in our communities and how can we like really care about everybody who's hurt and really be curious, how is the hurt happening? And where do we do like pragmatic action about the hurt instead of getting lost in a narrative about, um, you know, elites and what they're doing and, and, and a bunch of laws that, that like we, can't, we don't have a lot of control over, honestly. Thank you both so much. I think um, something I deeply admire about both of you, the work you do, and um, by that I mean what you publish, but also your pedagogy, is the like importance of studying history um, to really challenge the spectacle that neoliberalism wants to make out of threats to trans and queer life and the the spectacle and the the space it creates and how we conceptualize ourselves. <laughs> as trans and queer people in relation to violence and harm, um, whether that's something that's over there, whether that's something that we are falsely thinking we're safe from. So I think this conversation is so, so vital and I really appreciate this. I'm gonna ask the third question now, which is in the spirit of this event series and the staff of students of social justice program, what are your aspirations for material anti-racism and what role does the university worker have in this vision? I think we agreed that I'm gonna start this one. <laughs> um, um... I love the term material anti-racism that you all are using because we're living in this like DI, DEI nightmare where it's just like um, every institution is trying to appear to be addressing um, white supremacy through some very surface interventions. 
and it puts, you know, um, yeah, it just puts a few people on campuses under a lot of pressure. I mean, like the way the typical patterns I see are things like they're appointing like new DEI administrators at a lot of universities. And then those people are supposed to like receive complaints, but like there's not actually any new capacity to like deal with the really intense things that are actually happening to students, faculty and staff on those campuses. Um, you know, more and more of my students are unhoused, are like in the kinds of crisis we're all talking about and really isolated for various reasons and whatever. And, and there's not any real support for the ways in which that's about um, material racism, you know? Um, and so I just love the the push to be like, let's move away from symbolic statements and um, surface reforms to actually being like, what are the conditions people are living under that would actually um, dismantle the racism and the impacts of racism in people's daily lives? I appreciate that. Um, I like to think of university workers, I, I mean, even just like the phrase, your use of the phrase university worker is a great phrase there instead of um, just like students or faculty, or, because really it's like, wherever we are, we organize. And the university is just like a place, just like if we worked at a hospital, just like if we were students at high school, just like if we were all, you know, um, cleaning up a hotel together, whatever job or place we have as a student or whatever is a place to organize. And all of the systems that we want to fight are present wherever we are. So on our university campuses, they're all tied, you know, on my campus, like the criminal justice department is like so tied up with the Seattle police department. Like, I mean, it's wild, right? But that's true at every campus tied up with the military stuff, tied up with the arms producers, tied up with, you know, racist approaches to science, tied up with, I mean, yesterday, Dorothy Roberts, you know, the amazing uh, uh, Black feminist scholar spoke on my campus, you know, all of her work is about um, racism in the um, uh, child welfare system, also known as the family policing system and how to abolish that system. And she was talking about this woman, this professor at Harvard, who like, literally does all the scholarship promoting the idea that like white people should like adopt black children and like save them from their families and and from their communities and there shouldn't be can't even they shouldn't even be allowed to have other people in their family take them on when they're struggling for other people in their communities because the whole thing is like bad for them I mean just like the kinds of stuff that comes out of universities is so fucked up <laughs> like ouch you know I mean that was just an example I hadn't heard that I was like that person is teaching at Harvard and saying these like genocidal messages anyway um so yeah, wherever we are is the spot to organize and wherever we are is the spot to do mutual aid, you know? So like, I think, I mean, I think there's a lot of potential for doing really, really, really beautiful um, work, um, mutual aid work on campuses. Like so many people are having psychiatric, mental health, uh, like crises and like the systems on the campuses are like, you know, totally minimal. Like if you wait six weeks to get one appointment and you can only have this many appointments and there's nobody, we have no counselors for people of color and none who are queer and trans and none who are, you know, like just the classic, you know, like it's just really inadequate. And there's no support for like solving conflict or dealing with like the really big issues that come up between students or between students faculty besides like, you know, kind of carceral type logics. And so there's so many opportunities for us to create like peer support networks, support groups, like, um, you know, way, groups for supporting and mediating conflicts that we don't have to use the police. Like there's so, we can be creating the world we want to live in in the campus community because it's just it's a, it's a place we're all together just like we could at any workplace or any place and so I feel like I've been really moved like in my school some students started just like a food bank for each other and I was and just like even doing that and they were doing it from a feminist perspective and some other students started a support group for survivors of violence because there's nothing like that on our campus and so doing some of that stuff not through the institution but autonomous from the institution as a site for organizing and then as a site for also saying like oh how do we want to how does this relate to our cops off campus um, campaign how does this relate to our campaign um, to um to address the ways that our campus is acting as like a gross landlord in a, in the neighborhood or whatever it is. Um I think that mutual aid is really needed on our campuses cuz there's so people are in so much crisis from all the usual things. Um and we get to do the really deep anti-racist organizing when we get to know each other through that build that kind of build build each other's survivability but also build the kind of relationships that come from collaborating. Um and so for me um the campus is is juicy. And there's just like a long, long history and contemporary reality of really, really amazing radical campus organizing in every social movement. And also the right wing is trying to organize on our campuses. So we have to be here organized because they're here. Um, you know, for sure. I, I think we see this a lot, you know, those of us who work um, 
you know, to oppose Israeli colonization of Palestine, you know, the right and and um, and Zionists have a, have very big campus presences and very much funded. And so it's really, really hard to do anti-Zionist work on campuses. And there's a lot of targeting of anti-Zionist activists. And so we really need to be well organized, have a lot of solidarity, be connected to all the other related groups that care about racism and colonialism. Um, that's just one example. But it's it's just like it's a spot to do the work. It's a, it's a place also, I think, that a lot of young people practice really radical tactics and then um, continue that for the rest of their lives. So it's like a wonderful training ground for activists and organizers because it's where people often are on the younger side, but it can also be really intergenerational and tied to community organizing that's happening outside of the campus uh, space. So um, so I feel like there's a lot of potential for it. I think we should study the history of campus activism more and like its most radical iterations and, and what's happening in, for camp, in campus organizing outside of the US, which tends to be more um, developed and often more radical. I mean, even just like in Canada, like not even very far away or even in parts of the US that are less US, like, like Puerto Rico, there's really amazing, um, uh, student organizing, I think all of that helps us get a little more bold in what we imagine we could do. Uh, thank you so much, Dean. I'll sign me up for all that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, when I, you know, read the term, you know, material anti-racism, speak, thinking uh, specifically about Berkeley, right, because we could just keep going on and on, and that's what we need to do, but, right, like, um, always reminding ourselves and each other and every person in a position of power above, below, beside you, that there are right now entire aircraft carriers floating in oceans around the world whose only job is to murder lots of people. And so if there's that many resources, whatever we can imagine here is possible. Whatever we can imagine here is possible, right? And so what does that mean, right? an actual living wage for janitorial workers, every worker on this campus, and I don't mean $30 an hour, I mean $300 an hour, right? Free housing, free healthcare for all of us, for all of our students, stipend, not only free tuition, but stipends for students to go to school, right? So you actually, and maybe you could end up going to school for four years and you've saved $20,000, right? What would that world be? Um, you know, thinking about open admissions, um, you know, not simply like minimally inc increasing, which always actually ends up being a decreasing of Black, Brown, and Indigenous students on UC Berkeley's campus, right? That's a, a problem that could be solved if there was, you know, if there was, yeah, I won't go into that. Um, you know, the, the um, giving back, you know, remains of people that are held captive right now at UC Berkeley, right? Giving back land, Ohlone land that was stolen and continues to be stolen every day, which is UC Berkeley, right? All those things are possible. Like the, the endless catastrophe that we are currently living is not inevitable. And I think that that's, sitting with that reality is so hard for all of us and remembering that for all of us, right? Because the way that we reproduce the logic of the state and all of our interactions all the time is like, oh, well, there's not funds for that. And remember, there's an aircraft carrier sitting off the coast somewhere. So there's always money, there's always resources. And demanding that we have access to the things that not only that we, we collectively want um, and need, but also like what's going to make life more joyful, more fun, more exciting, more colorful, more vibrant, right? It's not just about the bare minimum to survive. It's like, what does thriving look like at the end of the world? I really appreciate that. I think the this is a language actually that the university is using a lot right now in these initiatives for thriving and for belonging. And I'm, I'm um, we're supposed to pivot and open to, to Q and A. I don't, I don't see any questions in the chat. So I'm gonna pause here to say, if you have questions, which I know some of you do, please drop them in the chat. I'll bring them up. I did want to ask a follow-up around that about, I'm really moved, Eric, at the sentiment around um, whatever we can imagine here is possible, that, um, that this endless catastrophe is not inevitable. I'm really moved by that because I think that um, I'm also really moved by students that I work with at the MCC who organize through uh, like the League of Filipino Students who talk about revolutionary hope and what optimism and what it means to be driven 
by the insistence that uh, catastrophe doesn't continue and that it doesn't have to continue. Um, I'm curious just to hear from both of you, maybe something that is moving you towards um, lately that feels like a, a, a pleasure on the horizon that is moving you in the work you're doing right now. Um, I'd love to hear about that as folks take time to drop their questions in the chat. All right, I'll go first. Um, so the things that are most exciting to me are often understood to be incredibly like quote unquote small scale. So two examples, both incredibly hyper local because I live there in the Bay. Well, again, I'm at the haunt of TJ Maxx, but otherwise I'm living there in the Bay. Um, so a group, two mutual aid projects, one is called Rad Mission Neighbors, and it's a group of um, former and current sex workers in the Bay Area, and they have a, a laundry day once a month for sex workers where you can just come to a laundromat and they'll pay to do your laundry and you just hang out, right? Um, so that's a really amazing, it doesn't take a ton of money, doesn't take a ton of organization, but it's just like something that helps people out, right? And people are building up skills together and organizing, right? Because there's been a kind of a resurgence of attacks on sex, sex workers, particularly in the mission in San Francisco because of the hypergentrification and on and on. We could talk about that for a long time. So that's one of them. Then another one um, is, uh, you know, there's been also a kind of continued um, attack on what little public space remains in San Francisco. For example, the fencing off of the BART Street Plaza at 24th Street BART, right? Um, because of unlawful vendors, right? Putting that in quotation marks because Uber, Airbnbs, you know, all the, all the scooters are all unlawful vendors, but, you know, the city loves to give them lots of money, right? So unlawful vendors, meaning um, working class people of color primarily. So they fenced it off. And then people were like, you know what? no, this is our space. We live in SROs. This is our community cultural space where we've been hanging out, you know, for hundreds of years, actually, on this, this plot of land. So they took all the fences down, right? So mission defense, like a fence can be put up, but a fence can also just be taken down. And so I think that those, you know, again, the really small scale, um, you know, fairly local examples um, you know, really give me life because I'm like, oh, people can just, you know, take these, take these little acts and they actually build up on top of each other and really do produce different, you know, conditions of possibility. And I think that that's really exciting to me. Yeah. Uh, two projects that I've learned about in, like only in the last year that really exciting to me. One is Thorn Self-Defense, which is a group based out of Chicago that sends self-defense kits to people who ask them for them, um, especially prioritizing Black trans women, but it's mostly trans women in general who ask for them that have things in them like a certain kind of baton, uh, like the weapons, like straight up weapons that like literally save people's lives. You know, um, I feel like that is really a seatbelt cutter. I mean, just like, it's really deep to just be like, what are the things people are facing and what do people actually need? That really moved me. And then also this group um, based out of um, Massachusetts called Trans Asylum Seekers Network. One of the things that they started based on was to respond to when there was that period where there was a lot of trans asylum seekers um, in that caravan um of, of migrants and there was like some people there was like some some orgs that were trying to help people like find sponsors in the U.S. who who they could come and like stay with which is a really important beautiful thing but the problem was a bunch of people um like made that connection and had someone come stay with them and then like kind of couldn't handle who that person really was like that person is like might might be you know not speaking English they might be illiterate they might have different they might be traumatized and have a lot going on whatever and so a lot of people evicted those women from their houses. And the um, people who started Tassin were like, this is not acceptable to have people come and offer them, you know, three months of housing and nothing else. And so Tassin is promising five years of support to every woman that they receive. And a lot of those people, so it's like, they get them housing. They raise money for that. They and they like have a bunch of apartments people can move into and they like help them learn English if that's what they want to do. And they help people find um like whatever kinds of support they need for whatever trauma they've been going through. They do like really deep political education with all those people and be like, hey, this is why we believe what we believe. What do you think? You know, like really deeply build connective support and they help people figure out healthcare. I mean, like everything. It is, that's such a tall order. They have 35 asylum seekers that they are currently doing that with. 
and it's a small group, all volunteer, no one's getting paid. And I'm just like that. And they're, and they're really disciplined about how they do it. It's just amazing to see people like actually operationalizing stuff like that. Like, the, like everyone deserves that kind of support. Who's going through this horrible stuff, like where you have to like run and leave your country and go to this very hostile racist place, in the United States, like everyone deserves this, but nobody gets that. You know what I mean? Like, it's so like whatever minimal social services are out there are so crappy and judgmental. And, and so just to me to see people just being like, this is what is deserved. And we're going to try to give it to these 35 people. And if, if we were all doing that, you know, um, then a lot of people would be like less, their lives would be longer. You know what I mean? So I think those are two like projects where I see people like deep digging, deep long-term commitment, figuring it out together. Of course, there's conflict in the groups. Of course, there's things that are hard. Of course, you know, not all the asylum seekers are having these time living and being roommates, what all the things that can come up, come up, you know, and people are just really working hard at it. It's really cool. Thank you both so much. We had a question come in the chat. Um, could you two speak to how you see social media hurting or helping mutual aid and direct action work and what to be cautious about around social media? I guess I'm supposed to start according to our method. Um, oh, such a good question. Um, there's a number of things. Like one thing I'm really concerned about, obviously social media can be really rad in the sense that like, we can often find out a lot more about local small like mutual aid projects or other initiatives than we would otherwise know. Like I really noticed that from like what it was like to be, you know, active in these movements from the mid nineties on, like, I just know a lot more about what's happening in other places and get inspiration, can reach out to people, find out advice, you know, like that's really cool. Um, and sometimes it can help us get the word out on it though. I think like trying to get the word out through like corporate platforms that hate us is pretty un like unreliable. Um, you know, like the way that like Facebook will like cut you off if you're like doing a live stream of like police hurting you, you know what I mean? Like we don't want to rely on them to get our word out. Um, anyway, um, my concerns are many. One is I think that social media has really transformed um, a lot of things about how we see our work. A lot of people can't tell the difference between talking about something and doing it or posting a picture of something and doing it, like really can't tell the difference. So I think a lot of people are demobilized by it. They're like, I've done my piece because I argued with somebody about it on social media or I it's like very like individualizing and self-branding stuff. And so it's really hard to like, remember, oh, collective action means like you're part of a group and you're all do actually doing stuff together. That's material, not just um, symbolic. I think a lot of people are confused about whether the point of our movements is to get the word out about things. That is not the point of our movements. Like getting the word out or political education is part of movement work, but we actually are trying to like materially dismantle like cages, like borders, like fire cops. Like if we're not actually changing the conditions like if people didn't get housing or like if a cop didn't get fired like maybe nothing happened you know what I mean like it's it can become only about getting the word out which is like that kind of mythology that oppression is about misunderstanding it is not so we can get the world out all day long and things could not change so that's concerning to me I also think that um you know it's just really it's really uh given people a lot of lack of capacity around a lot of social skills and so there's a, a danger people do a lot of like weird conflict stuff like wanting to be seen a certain way on social media so instead of me being like oh here eric what, what happened in the meeting like i felt weird about what you said i'm like going online and telling everybody that eric's bad that is really disorganizing and bad for our movements because of course i'm in it for life with everyone in the groups i'm in and in the other groups doing related stuff whether i like them or not i hopefully am committed to them as people even when they make mistakes. And so being able to have skills for um, approaching conflicts focused on repair rather than like looking good myself and stigmatizing others and getting them excluded, really important. Um, and that has been really disorganizing for our movements. I think also just a level of overwhelm and distraction. I think a lot of people feel burnt out. People use the word burnt out a lot. I think they're actually um, our nervous systems are literally like exhausted by constantly receiving bad news, being part of those kinds of conflicts or witnessing them, being scared of those kinds of conflicts, um, being scared someone's going to come for you. Um, not, it's very hard to like ever rest or ever, um, discern like what's important now. I, I've read some interesting research about how like we lack solitude. If you define solitude as a time when you're not taking in anybody else's ideas, and you're just like being with yours, 
if people are like just listening to podcasts all the time, looking at Instagram the whole time when they're on the bus, like people are missing those moments of just like um, actually digesting their own experiences. And one of the re results of that, according to some researchers, is that like we're de-skilled around dealing with big feelings because experiencing big feelings like I'm on the bus and then I remember how sad I am that my friend died or like that I had this breakup or this thing that was said to me in this meeting really hurt me and was transphobic or whatever if I don't if none of it bubbles up because every time I feel a little weird I look at the phone or I like go to the distraction I become pretty like I like de-skilled at like big feelings and so then I think people are not very good at supporting others having big feelings not very good at like experiencing big feelings like there's just a whole set of skills there that I think are are lost and that we can see that in some of the movement conflict problems we're having um, is related to people not uh, having some of those skills. So I'm worried about a lot of things. I'm, I'm worried about, about us all. I mean, I learned this from Eric, you know, that basically we're all like unpaid content writers for these like horrible, horrible um, corporations that are um, like destroying our cities and the planet and everything else. So I'm I'm quite worried about it. I'm not like I'm trying not to be like an old fogey who's like, oh my God, this is so bad because everybody always thinks the new technology is ruining things, but it's just changing things, but it's changing things in ways where we need to make sure we're not like, yes, we should play with it. We should tr figure out how it can help us, but are we being played by it more than we're playing it? You know, like how do we, what do we need to put in place so that it's not mostly playing us? And I do not think we have that sophistication yet. <laughs> it's it's new and it's mostly playing us right now in, in ways that I'm quite worried about. Yeah, I definitely um, would agree with all of that. And I think that um, a couple of things, it's like, the, you know, the problem is not the technology itself, it's the kind of um, apparatus of its ownership and deployment, right? And we always, I'm, I'm really fascinated in the vision of the kind of, you know, uh, decolonial anarchist hacker of the 90s that then became like the oligarch of our contemporary moment. Like that's actually what we got when we thought we were gonna need some, you know, there's lots of those kinds of memes. Um, and so, you know, and there are people that are doing these really interesting um, projects around technology and trying to think about this, but right, nothing's kind of come up to the level that we actually are using it all the time, I think. Um, and so, you know, I think like Dean, right, it's like, how are we gonna use it strategically? How are we gonna think about access? Um, but in, in two ways, right? Technology is not always necessarily more accessible. And I think that there's like that trap. And I think that we've actually built ourselves, like that's a huge problem in thinking about disability justice, right? Um, what does it mean to not have flyers posted on the lamppost anymore when you have to be in like a certain kind of algorithmic social media, whatever, to have access to that. Like that's actually inaccessible because then the people can't say whatever. Um, so I think that that's part of it. So maybe it's like a, a, a dual approach. So maybe we're going to like use the social media some knowing that if we're doing anything that important, the account's going to get shut down. Right. And you could almost measure the kind of impact of your work by how long your account stays up, I would say. Um, because if you're actually challenging the structural power, they're eventually going to do it. And you can see this, right? They've, they've come for like a lot of the big leftist accounts and then reinstated all the right wing accounts. And that's the, few, you know, it's going to go more and more in that direction. But, you know, while we're using that and experimenting around that and, you know, like thinking about the new forms of technology and new audience is also like remembering the old ones. So maybe it's like putting up a TikTok and also wheat pasting, right? Like doing both those things and not letting go one or the other, like how to like, you know, remember those quote unquote, older skills, which, you know, are from the ancient days of 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, while still being in, in interested and invested in thinking about these newer forms of technology, right, because we based us the technology as well. So how can we like think about those together? while also understanding the kind of mm, the parameters within which they they work and who's owning the means of production of either. Thank you so much. This is really exciting to hear um, from you both. We have another question in the chat from Alexis. They ask, I love the reminder of possibility and imagination. If you can, from the top of your head, may you give resources to learn about the role of gender binary slash gender violence under fascism? Do you have any good ones, Dean? <laughs> I don't actually. I mean, I have some, but yeah. I mean, I think, I guess I, I guess the place, the way I mainly get there is by, um, like first all of our studying of just like how um 
the enforcement of gender and family norms is essential to like shaping capitalism, shaping white supremacy, like that sort of black feminist analysis, that like women of color feminist analysis, you know, insight color of violence, their anthologies, you know, the work of people like Dorothy Roberts, Angela Davis, like the work that shows us how um, uh, gender and sexuality are like fundamental to the the framing of you know the the creation of all the kind of like machines of harm that we want to take down is is essential and then i've i've more recently been like studying fascism more closely because that wasn't a huge part of my studies um and i think uh just like i'm like do the, are the are the texts that i'm reading really i mean i would recommend there's a new book out um called that i'm going to put in the um uh, it, this is the title um, in that that's an anthology and it's like a lot of different anti-fascist stuff and it's got like it's got like some interesting trans stuff in it it's got like a really cool like history of black anti-fascist work it's got all this interesting stuff so some of that might be really useful I haven't read the whole book yet just parts of it um, I've also enjoyed um, I've, I'm actually really enjoying this uh, podcast um that maybe some people are also listening to that is that has elements of like some some gender and, and feminist analysis in it called it did happen here that's about um anti-fascist um activism in the 80s and 90s in minneapolis and portland primarily but kind of gives you a picture of it it's kind of cool because you see like young people organizing and there's stuff about gender inside their groups and um it's less about what i so what the parts i've listened to so far less about like how fascists are mobilizing gender norms um, those are the things that come to mind for me. I mean, ba basically, I think I'm using a woman of color feminist analysis to understand the background context of violent infrastructure that is always being mobilized and is particularly being mobilized and called for by different threads of fascists and right wingers in the U.S. like now and historically. What would you add, Eric? Yeah, I think that that sounds right. And I'll put um, a couple of links in the chat in a minute. I, um, uh, you know, I, I teach a trans studies class and a lot of the thinking is vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, indigenous trans studies, queer studies kinds of people and thinking about the instantiation of California and California mission system as, you know, proto-fascism. Um, and so I think that that kind of work and, and in alignment with what you're saying um, helps us think about that, right? Again, the kind of um, forceful and genocidal imposition of what we now understand to be the gender binary by the California mission system, what became California, the mission system um, on various uh, tribal populations as being, um, you know, one of the roots of what then becomes called fascism, because of course, you know, where did the Nazis learn it, right? There's lots of work on that. Thank you so much. Yeah, for studying eugenics. I mean, honestly, like so much of the Black feminist work that is so helpful and disability studies work, it's just, if we study eugenics, it's kind of the, it's like the, it's the map of, it's just all the same stuff that keeps recurring, right? And it's got this huge investment in who reproduces and how. So it's very much like a gender and sexual um, project. Thank you both. Um, we have another question from the chat. Um, they said, so thinking back to League of Filipino Students, other similar organizations that are focused on international solidarity and the Third World Liberation Front that passed through our campus here, how do you two understand the praxis required to bridge difficult gaps when doing mutual aid work across often divisive or forcibly divided lines of identity, such as race and anti-Blackness specifically, class, immigration status, ability, et cetera? And the person clarifies that divisive as in the sense that they have been made so by conservative and liberal politics, not that they are inherently so. Yeah, I would just say, like, I think that one of the benefits of mutual aid work is that it is a place where we have to work that out, right? I mean, we don't always do that successfully, of course, you know, there's that's the danger, but it's like, um, it is such a great question. Like, it's like, when we show up to do mutual aid work, it might be because we experience something and we like, you know, and we're showing up looking for support or help, or we experienced it before, we want to help people who are going through it now, or we heard about it and we're like, want to help people who are going through it, you know, we heard about it through our friend or through the news or whatever. And when you show up, you know a certain amount about the experience. You're like, I know how it was for me, or I know how it was for my friend, or I know how they're talking about it on the news or in the community or whatever. And there's all a bunch of stuff you don't know about it. Like, you know, like 
I actually haven't really thought like, oh my God, what's it like for people with disabilities to go through this immigration thing? Or how is it different for um, black students to experience campus security or whatever? Like, you know, we might know parts of the experience, but inevitably we don't know all of it. And so we, the process of being in groups together where we are different from each other and where people who are maybe coming to a mutual aid project with different, different pathways to this crisis, builds our solidarities. Ideally, if we're doing it well, our solidarity capacity increases because it's like, oh my God, I didn't know about that slice of this experience or how that really hurts these people in a different way or how these people get treated this way or why this is particular a particular vulnerability I never even thought of, right? That's happening, hopefully for all of us all the time, that kind of learning about more and more and more layers of how the system works for people and that we wouldn't know from our own experience or what we're hearing in the mainstream or whatever. Um, and so I think for a lot of mutual aid groups doing political education, I mean, part of that political education is just inherent to doing mutual aid. Like I think about this, like people I know, you know, in a lot of doing a lot of um, encampment support for unhoused people. And you're sitting at the charging station, charging people's phones, or you're sitting there giving out water or whatever. You're, you're sitting around at a table, you know, like handing something out or talking to people or whatever, and you just are chatting with other people who are part of the mutual aid project or people who are charging their phones or whatever, just whoever's around. And you're just actually finding out what other people think about stuff. And you're just like, oh my God, that's how that works in your home country. Never heard about that. Or, oh, I didn't know the cops were here doing that the other day. Why do they do that? Or, or you're having a big conversation, like, what do we believe about the state or elections or whatever? But that kind of political ed is like inherent to the, just like being together in groups and doing tasks and like getting chatting, which is like so beautiful. I think that's most of our political development happens through those things. And then also a lot of groups will do political education as part of mutual aid groups like oh fuck we all need to do a disability justice workshop there's a lot of misunderstanding in this group or there's a way we're doing our uh, mutual aid project that's actually cutting some people out we didn't realize it we just heard this feedback we're gonna like work on this deep or you know like that kind of thing that's about like trying to explicitly increase that solidarity because of the exact danger that you're talking about Tara that like I mean we are we're all showing up with these divisions trained in you know, um, by the systems into our minds and also in the way they've organized us materially. And so we have to like undo that. I think we're, I think we are inherently capable of that and like talented at that because relationally we just have to like bust the myths, you know, or like clear up the misunderstandings that have been implanted. And if we hang out, that can happen, especially if we actually talk to each other, if we actually give each other feedback, if we're not afraid of conflict. So I can be like, oh, hey, that hurt or hey, I don't think that's right or we got to change this. It, if we're all buttoning our lips and being really scared to share our feedback with each other or like jumping down each other's throats about every little thing and not having any room for repair, it's much harder to grow those solidarities. There's just got to be room for like mistakes and learning. And that is hard because we all are showing up with a lot of hurt, you know, and fear. So, um, but that's, I mean, that's what I see and how this kind of like plays out. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would obviously agree with what Dean just said, and just you know, it's a it's a process, um, and I think it's about building those collective skills um, and thinking about what forms of really deep solidarity. Because I think that we're oftentimes good at like kind of a real surface solidarity, and then things get hard and people bail, and sometimes you have to bail, and that's fine too. But sometimes like the kind of per the perpetual bailing. Um, you know, just reproduces the problem instead of like, you know, what does it mean to stick with something for some long period of time um, and learn from each other in a deep way? And I think that we don't actually, it's not only that we don't necessarily have those skills, but we don't necessarily even have the opportunities. There's not a lot, you know, a lot, a lot of us get forced for all kinds of reasons to move around a lot or not be in one place or, you know, you're living in this place and you love it and you get evicted or you can't afford the rent anymore. So then your entire community gets disarticulated so there's all those material realities that don't like let us like um, both imagine and live what does it mean to organize with the same kind of groupish of people meaning it's going to change but like some similar people for 20 30 40 years right and lots of um you know a lot of people in the world have have had that experience and I think that looking at that and thinking like what does that mean what does that look like um what skills did they learn together you know what problems did it also create because again it's not going to be perfect it's going to fall to pieces sometimes you have to leave sometimes you know there's actual intense abuse you know all those things come up right just like in anything um but you know like imagining what it would mean to 
um, make yourself vulnerable enough so that you could like hear some feedback, like Dean was saying, give some feedback, um, you know, because the kind of collective political commitment that you're making to each other, you know, might be more important than like the, the it, again, if it's a kind of like minor infraction or something like that, knowing that we're all capable of harming each other, right? In the same way that we're all capable of, of being survivors of harm. Thank you both. Something interesting that's coming up for me listening to this uh, discussion and this question and the discussion on, on social media is I think both of you are surfacing that um, this work is, is long work. <laughs> so it's like a, it's like a, a long arc. Um, and I'm curious uh, what you all could offer in terms of reflections on how to sustain that tenacity through the through the long arc of it um, for folks who are here. Uh, Dean and I have known each other for a long time. <laughs> That's the other the other funny part. Um, it's also, you know, it's it is a, it's an interesting moment. I don't know, Dean, you might want to talk about this, but like I'm at this time, both in like how long I've been organizing and my you know, uh, alleged chronological age where, you know, I'm moving into this like, oh, the wisdom phase or something like that. That's, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Um, that being said, you know, I think that it changes a lot. You know, I don't, you know, I don't actually have a philosophy that I wake up and I'm like, oh, you know, revolutionary love. Sometimes it's revenge, you know, sometimes it's like iced tea and revenge. Sometimes it's rage. Sometimes it's love, sometimes it's hurt, you know, there's like all those things and they're all part of it. Like it's, for me, there's not like a, you know, the way that sometimes like those like social justice books get written and it's like, oh, I, you know, you have to love your, love the people more than you hate the enemy, like all those kinds of things. And I think sometimes that's totally true, but sometimes it's not, and that's okay too, right? Because what we're trying to do, meaning all of us, not Dean and I, but like all of us is tear down this really horrible world that was incredibly or in, intricately built up and continues to be built and do something that's totally different, right? And so that's really hard. And it's gonna take all these tools and it's also gonna take all these feelings, right? I don't actually believe that we can leave rage behind. I don't believe that we can even leave hate behind, right? If you don't hate the thing that's trying to kill you, I don't know. Um, you know, I think that those are important tactics and tools for some of us, not all of us, people work differently. But for me, that's something that, um, you know, I want to make space for it. Right. Um, so there's my um, incredibly um, optimistic, uh, <laughs> effective messaging, but it's also just the truth. Sometimes love for the people, sometimes rage. And often iced tea if you're Eric. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think that the thing about it, I think people want to be fueled by hope exclusively. And um, I think it's very, very, very hard to maintain like kind of a naive, simple hope because things are super, super grim. And if I wasn't acknowledging that, my strategies and tactics are going to probably be like really inadequate. You know what I mean? Like that would lead me to like shitty liberal reform. It's like if I was just like, oh my God, the mayor and the county executive, they don't mean to hurt us. You know, it's like, no, that like they like human beings can be like drafted into genocidal projects and like mostly are. Like if I can, if I can face that reality, oh, sorry, there's loud noises happening. Um, if I can face the kind of difficult realities of what, you know, like how, like how profoundly painful it is to know the amount of suffering and the amount of effort that goes into making people suffer. And, you know, it's going to make for better response to that. That's based in reality, you know? Um, and so having to look at what's hard and, and cope with that. Um, and to be real, like the only thing that makes that possible is like the relationships. Like, it's just like, like, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm in these movements because I really hope that we reduce suffering. And that could be that we were, that in my life, I reduce a small amount of suffering for a handful of people, or it could be that we together, like really come up with some awesome stuff and like get some people out of cages for, like that we haven't met and will never meet or whatever, you know, um, or prevent certain kinds of like, you know, horrible disasters. I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know how well our movements are working. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but like when I'm in movements with other people and we're resisting, I 
get to feel creativity. I get to have people to mourn with. I get to have people who have my back because the system wants us isolated and alone. And most people are. Most people are really isolated in our society, don't have any deep friendships, don't have anyone they really talk to about what's happening. I see this. It, it used to be that was more likely to happen to you if you were older. You know, like people get isolated in marriages and jobs and stuff, but now it's also really young people are really isolated. Um, used to be the young people were like the best at socializing because like, like youth is like, like that's like kind of part of adolescence and being young is like more social socializing. But now because all that's been put online, a lot of people don't have any relationships in person or don't have like deep relationships where they would really talk to folks about their hardest feelings and stuff. So organizing gets you that. It gets you like people. Like it gets you to like, doesn't mean you always like them. It also means you're going to disagree and people are going to like mess up. But like, I want to live connected to others and in reality, including the the painful realities. I want to like actually mourn the losses with other people I care about. I want to try to do things that reduce suffering, even if I fail. When, when Dorothy Roberts spoke yesterday at my school, she was like, oh yeah, I, it's so interesting being in Seattle because for nine years, she was part of this thing. Like there was some court case in Washington state and the um, court said that the child welfare system in Washington state was racist and fucked up. And she was part of like four national child welfare experts who were convened and they would meet every year, four times in Seattle and do all this other work trying to fix the, the, uh, the family policing system in Washington state. And she was like, it didn't work. And that's why I'm an abolitionist. Like, she, like having old people be able to be like, oh yeah, I tried a bunch of shit and it didn't work instead of trying to defend that, that thing forever, which is what most lawyers and professors like of her stature would do is just defend their terrible tactic forever. She's like, oh yeah, that shit doesn't work. I want to be an old person like her who able, who's able to be frank, be able to like model. Yeah, we made mistakes. Yeah, learn from it. Don't do what we did. Don't go try to fix the child welfare system. Let's all abolish it. Like I'm curious about that as a sustainability practice, she seemed like a very alive human being to me, you know, like, and delightful to be around. And I was like, oh, that's because she's still curious. She's still learning stuff. She's still connecting with people of all ages about cool ideas. She's, so all of that, I think, Jen, like for me, studying social movements, studying resistance is, a, is not something I do as my job. It is a form of pleasure. Like every podcast, every movie I can watch, talking to people who are going, who's going to the Atlanta Forest Defender stuff. What did they learn? What was it like on the ground? Like, you know, that kind of stuff isn't like work. That's like pleasure. It's like, oh my God, hope for change. Oh, so it feels so relieving just to see someone drop that banner, just see, you know, like whatever, see people coordinated to show up at that county council hearing and make that noise. Like just trying to get fed by all that stuff instead of only focusing. I think what most people are like doom scrolling alone. That will suck your will to live. That'll be like, yeah, I, I, yes, I, there's nothing I can do about these wars, these, you know, these budgets by myself with this phone, but if I'm, if I want to actually get involved in it, and I can't be involved on every front, I might be like, I'm just focusing on stopping sweeps in Seattle, or I'm just focusing on the police budget, or I'm just focusing on supporting these people coming out of prison or whatever, whatever we're working on, most of us, multiple things, but you know, like not everything, but knowing you're part of it, knowing how it's connected to all the other stuff. It's just like, yeah, like I'm going to die fighting like, and that it, we're, this shit's definitely not going to be resolved in my lifetime. And I think it's going to get a lot worse in my lifetime. And I don't know what's going to happen after that, but like, how do I want to have spent this life? What will have been satisfying? Should I be like, you know, mindlessly working a shitty job so I can buy stuff that nobody needs or like try to be with people I care about who may be different from me, who may annoy me, who may fuck up, who I may fuck up against, you know? And try to just try stuff and um, figure out what's funny or what was a moment of pleasure or connection in it. I think that's the frame. It's like, like the expectation in our society is either like, I'm going to go like get rich and like be happy from that stuff. But P.S. that doesn't work. Or I'm going to go be the social justice leader and I'm going to win the big case. And it's going to be this. And it's like, no, that also doesn't work. It's all pretty, you know, it, like that Buddhist idea, like practicing to be nobody special is really useful to me. Like we're all just like, I just want like us all to be really ordinary and do really ordinary pragmatic things locally that might help. <laughs> like that's all we're, it's like that, that is the horizon of pleasure and delight. And like, oh, also I ate a delicious berry. And like, I, my, you know, my friend made me laugh really hard. And like our group felt really satisfied by this, you know, when we stormed the city council hearing or when we, you know, gave out all this water or whatever, like those are the peak experiences of life, not some single crowning moment where we will see victory is not going to happen. Um, I think that shifting our mentality around that, it's really away from a consumerist hero savior story 
um, can actually make this all a lot more pleasurable. And there's just a lot of bummer, shitty things going on and it's okay to feel bad too. And that's, that's being in reality, you know. Thank you both so much. I'm deeply moved by what you all, all are sharing and um, I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. Um, we're kind of running up on our time here. So I wanna open it up for if either of you have parting or um, closing thoughts you wanna to share to the room, um, just a great gratitude to you both for being here and great gratitude to everyone for being part of this conversation and um, witnessing this with us. Um, so open it up again, if there's anything else you all wanna share, but otherwise, thank you so much. I'll just say, I mean, if there's anything that I want for us all, and we just that we all actually just get involved in some kind of local mobilization work and um, and mutual aid work. And I really encourage people to read that Vicki Osterweil book because I mean, Eric's talking about revenge, like Vicki is talking about people like tearing it down and how that's actually the only thing that ever changes things. Like that's a vital part of all movements. And so also all of us learning how to take more risks and do more high stakes actions. It, it's time, it's way past time. And so if that's part of what's possible for you, learning about that, and that might be very small escalations, like starting by you know, doing your mutual aid pro project in a way that's got more teeth or doing, um, you know, doing your campus organizing in a way that's got more teeth, but being, being willing and interested in studying, you know, stigmatized and criminalized social movement tactics um, is pretty essential right now. And, and, get, and getting out of ever any of that, you know, learning about why we don't support a pacifist approach, why we do not support stigmatizing other organizers and activists when they um, take up more militant approaches. Like that's that's like a really that's really a missing piece in most campus conversations that I hope folks will um, investigate. Yes, definitely um, echo that. And I also want to thank um, MCC and American Cultures and you specifically, Anman, um, for. Uh, bringing us together today and for everyone joining us. It was really nice to spend this time with you all. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, this was really wonderful. Thank you for being part of this conversation and hope to catch you all at the future um, SSJ event.